Hey, New Testament survey class. We're talking about the Gospel of Matthew today. Um, the Gospel of Matthew is the first Gospel, but it's probably not the first written, as we've talked about in uh, some previous lectures about the documentary uh, source hypothesis and synoptic problem, that the Gospel of Matthew may have been written later, uh, probably after uh, 70 AD. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a little bit. But let's talk about, first off, the connection uh, between the Old Testament and Matthew, but more importantly, the structure, because I think the structure plays into the Old Testament theme. Notice on the uh, left side of the screen here, I've got uh, Donald Hagner's commentary from the Word Biblical series. Um, it's volume 33a. It's the first part of Matthew. And notice he breaks down the outline of the chapters of Matthew. Um, and this is done in several commentaries. This is actually what he borrows from Dale Allison's commentary. Uh, which I don't have an electronic format, but I have this to show you. Um, it's a narrative sections and discourse sections. The N stands for narrative, story, uh, you know, and then there's discourse, which is teaching, ch uh, chunks of teaching. Notes 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And notice how many discourses there are. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. A lot of scholars agree on this breakdown of narrative in discourse alternation and also agree on this notion that there are five discourse sections now notice that the first book the first five books of the bible the torah or the pentateuch the books of moses there are five of those um, a lot of scholars believe this is intentional so as to connect the old testament story um, with matthew and there's other things that play into that if you look on the Left side of the screen, I've got pulled up Matthew 1, 22 through 23. Um, this is talking about the, uh, Jesus, the birth here. It says, all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. There are uh, about 11 incidences of, so this notion of this, so that it might be fulfilled or that it might be fulfilled formula, uh, same phrase in the Greek, where things happen in the life of Jesus or teachings in the life of Jesus, and they play off the Old Testament prophets or what have you. This section, Matthew 1, 22 through 23, uh, refers back to Isaiah 7, 14. We got Matthew uh, chapter 2, verse 15, points back to Hosea 11, 1. Matthew 2, 17 through uh, 18, points back to Jeremiah 31, 15. There's 1 and 2, 23, that's the connection's unknown. Uh, 4, 16, uh, 4, 14 through 16, points back to Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. Matthew 8, 17, points back to Isaiah 53, uh, four, and let me just go ahead and pull that up here, and that is eight, one, seven. My handy dandy computer will work here. I think it needs coffee like I do. My poor little surface is working hard. Um, and while that's there, we go. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our sores. Uh, Matthew 12, 17 through 8, 21. Ties back to Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Matthew 13, 14 through 15. Ties back to Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. Uh, Matthew 13, 35. Ties back to Psalm 78, 2. Uh, Matthew 21, 4 through 5. Ties back to Isaiah 62, 11. And Zechariah 9, 9. Matthew 27, 9 through 10. Ties back into Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 3. Uh, Jeremiah 32, 6 through 15. About the fate of Jesus. Judas, these all these 11 passages we find, uh, or verses, I should say, this well, this quotation formula, this promise fulfillment, so that it might be fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled formula, is a strong connection of continuity between the story of Jesus and these notions of what people perceive as being forerunners or mentions of uh, forerunners in the Old Testament. Uh, there's, a very again, that very strong connection with Jesus in uh, the Gospel of Matthew and the Old Testament, and, and Matthew itself in the Old Testament. Now, another thing that connects, that connects both Jesus uh, and the Old Testament is the very much a connection of Jesus being a new Moses. Now, um, this is kind of a comparison. This, Jesus is portrayed very much like a, a Moses-type figure. Um, especially true in the chapters leading up to the Sermon on the Mount. Um, chapters 1 through 2 especially are very strong with this notion of Jesus being a new Moses. Uh, 
Um, if you look back over in uh, chapter 1, verse 21, um, that mirrors, uh, let's see, let me pull that up here. My computer's going slow here. Okay, chapter 1, verse 21 um, is the, um, there it goes, talking about uh, she will bear a son and your name, uh, to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Um, this dream where an angel foretells of Jesus saving his people uh, very much mirrors the popular lore of Moses where uh, from uh, the writing, the Liber Antiquitatum Biblicarum, um, Philo's writing there. Um, now remember, a lot of Christians, a lot of Jewish people in this period, um, they not only knew of the Old Testament figures from the Old Testament text or stories, but the interpretations they fi found in writings of the era, such as Philo's LAB, or pseudo Philo, I should say, Philo probably didn't write it, the Liber Antiquitatum Biblicarum, or even Josephus's Antiquities, or some of the writings of Josephus, where these figures reinterpreted or retold, or some even call it rewritten Bible, rewrote these stories um, in a different manner, almost like a, a pulp, may, maybe a pulp notion, notion if you will. But anyway, in uh, LAB 913, Miriam has a dream where an angel foretells of Moses saving his people. So that's it mirrors Matthew 121, Joseph's dream. Matthew 2, 16 through 18, Jesus' birth, followed by Herod and Saul, the infants, mirrors Pharaoh's orders to kill every male child um, from Exodus 1, 15 through 22 at the time of Moses' birth. Pharaoh's order to kill the male Hebrew babies um, was because he learned a future liberator of Israel had been born. That's Josephus' Antiquities 2, 205 through 9 records that. Uh, that's point number three there. And that mirrors Matthew 2, uh, 2 through 18, where Herod had the children killed because he found out of the birth of the king of the Jews. Uh, fourth, uh, Jesus' new Moses is where, uh, comes from uh, uh, Matthew 2, 4 through 6, as well as Josephus' Antiquities 2, 205 and 234. Herod learned of the coming deliverer from the chief priests chief priest and scribes, and Pharaoh learned about the Hebrew deliverer from the sacred scribes. A fifth thing is when, Hebrew, when Herod wants to kill Jesus, Jesus is taken away to his homeland. That's 2, 13 through 14. And when Pharaoh wanted to kill him, Moses is forced to leave his homeland, Egypt. And that's Exodus 2, 15. An angel commands Joseph. This is sixth part here. Six, Jesus is new Moses. Uh, an angel commands Joseph and family to come back to Israel after the death of Herod the Great. Matthew 2, 19 through 20. And Moses was commanded to return to Egypt after the death of Pharaoh in Exodus 4, 19. Joseph takes his family back to Israel, Matthew 2.21, and Moses takes his family back to Egypt, Exodus 4.20. Now, I want to flip over here if I can get my computer to work. Oh, processor is not too great on my Surface tablet here, guys. I apologize. Um, let's look at Deuteronomy 9.9. 9. Let's see here. Okay, dope. Now, over in Deuteronomy 9, 9, this has a combination of Moses fasting 40 days and nights and sitting on a mountain as a teacher. Uh, if it'll pull up here. Today, McFly, today. Hello. Okay. There it is. When I went up to the mountain, this is Moses speaking. Of course, Deuteronomy, most of us in the, in the voice of Moses or the Lord speaking through Moses. When I went up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant of the Lord had made with you. I remained on the mountain 40 days and nights. I neither ate or bread or nor drink water okay this very much mirrors matthew chapter 4 verse 2 in matthew 5 1 um, again my computer is extra slow when i record i apologize guys over matthew 4 2 jesus fast for 40 days and nights when he's in the wilderness the temptation uh, of jesus uh, you know he's given these visions and stuff and um Let's see if, well, his computer eventually will work. Um, over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, Jesus sits down on the mountain to teach this new law, this new discourse, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which is, it portrays him also as the new Moses. Um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and skip that there. But anyway, the, these, this 
Deuteronomy 9.9 9 is mirrored in Matthew 4.2 and Matthew 5.1. We'll come back to 5.1 anyway, so go ahead and go there. But there are at least seven points of connection between Jesus and Moses, Jesus being the new Moses, or being portrayed like a Moses. Um, like a, uh, a guy, in the, uh, a man uh, in the vein of Moses. Now, there are some passages in um, Matthew where there's, and there's a bunch of these examples, and I kind of breeze through them, where there seems to be some sort of tension between the Jewish leadership of the writers, Matthew Gospel Writers Day, and the, and the Jewish leadership of the synagogues, what have you. Um, over in chapter 3, verse 27, John the Baptist calls the Sadducees and Pharisees a brood of vipers, urging them to repent. In chapter 5, uh, verse 20, uh, let me get that pulled up there because I'm right near it. Chapter 5, verse 20, it says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds this, that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So that's a slight at the Pharisees and scribes. Chapter 9, verse 11 of Matthew Pharisees ask Jesus why uh, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus responds, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And that's a, a play off of Hosea 6.6. 6. Matthew 9.14, Jesus' disciples ask why Jesus' disciples don't fast like, or John, excuse me, John's disciples ask why Jesus' disciples don't fast like the Pharisees. Um, Matthew 9.34, Pharisees say that Jesus cast out demons by the power of the rule of the demons. Um, 12, Matthew 12, 2, Pharisees condemn Jesus and his disciples for breaking Sabbath law by pl uh, plucking grain. 12, 14, we see a discussion of the Sabbath with Jesus and the Pharisees plot to overthrow Jesus. They might kill him, or excuse me, plot they may have, it may have, how they may kill Jesus. Um, Matthew 12, 23 through 24, after Jesus had healed a demoniac, the crowds asked, can this be the son of David? But the Pharisees associate him with Beelzebub, or Beelzebul, excuse me, the ruler of the uh, demons. Um, Matthew 15, 1, scribes and Pharisees condemn Jesus and disciples for breaking the tradition of not washing hands before eating. Uh, chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites. And quote Isaiah, with the honor, the, the honor, honor you the lips, or they honor, honor him with the lips, hearts are far from me. <coughs> Excuse me. Matthew 15, 12 through 13, Jesus furthers condemnation of the Pharisees from 15, 1. Uh, 15, or excuse me, 16, 1, Matthew 16, 1, the Pharisees and Sadducees asked Jesus for a sign from heaven. Jesus says an evil generation asked for signs. That's in verse 4. Um, Matthew 16, 6, Jesus tells disciples to be aware of the yeast or the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 19, 3, Jesus, or excuse me, the Pharisees test Jesus on divorce. Um, we see over in, I lost my place, dad, give it. Matthew 21, 45 through 46, the chief priest and, and uh, Pharisees realized that Jesus had condemned them via parables. They wanted to arrest him, but feared the crowds. Um, Matthew 22, 15, the Pharisees plot to entrap Jesus. Matthew 22, 34 and following, one of the Pharisees tries to tra trip Jesus up by asking about the greatest commandment. Now over in Matthew 23, we have a rather interesting and lengthy passage. And this is, pardon the expression, Jesus just rips the Pharisees a new one. Um, he's really harsh on them. Uh, he condemns the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, he, you know, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Look at verse 13 there, you hypocrites. Look down at verse 16, woe to you, blind guides. Verse 23, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Okay, verse 25, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Calls in verse 26, you blind Pharisee. Verse 27, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. I mean, this this is a, pretty much a really rough, you know, roasting, if you will, of uh, the Pharisees uh, and their, their practices, the Sadducees. There's, there's a disconnect between the Matthean community, the community which the gospel writer is writing to, and the leadership of the synagogue around them. Um, possibly Caesarea is where this is being written to. We don't know for sure. But you know, even in 27, 25, the people, the Jewish people say, his blood be on us and our children. This is a slam on you know, some of the people of the day. Um, you know, Jesus is the new Moses. There's structure in, in the discourses in the fives like Torah. There's Old Testament quotes. There might be fulfilled formula. Um, you know, this writer 
that Matthew and this community to whom he's writing, the churches to whom he's writing, seem very Jewish, but they're not the type of Judaism, or at least con they're condemning the Judaism that's in power in the synagogues around them. There seems to be some separation. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe this is where there's a parting of the ways, if you will. Maybe, uh, but I mean, there seems to be, seems to be a very uh, Jewish Old Testament document, but it's not necessarily their Judaism. Now, again, let's go back to the Matthew and his attendant audience. May mention here that uh, there's at least five things that will mention here. First off, Matthew was a Jewish Christian. We can notice he was very influenced by the Septuagint, uh, the Old Testament at least, but especially the Septuagint translation. Some of his favorite expressions are indicative of contemporary Jewish usage, like the kingdom of heaven, the land of, uh, you know, land of blank, like the land of the you know, Old Testament, the land of Nod, something like that, the land of Egypt. Uh, a sub thing under this Matthew is Jewish Christian reflects traditions already in Jewish Christian setting, like fulfillment quotations, addenda, like in 12, 5 through 6, 12, 11, 24, 20. And Jesus reaffirms the law over in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, talks about the, uh, uh, the fulfillment of the law. I'll get my handy dandy computer working here. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Notice that demarcation law and the prophets. Um, remember the Old Testament that we have today, even the Jewish canon today is split up in the, the law, the prophets, or the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Um, so there may, may be that uh, demarcation. Probably by the time of Jesus, the law and the prophets were set in stone as being very solid, as being canon. The writings might have been a little more fluid in it. Uh, the New Testament, of course, uh, was very fluid up until uh, you know, first, second century. There seems to be more solidification. Anyway, uh, law well, of the prophets I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, nor, nor one stroke of a letter, will pass away uh, from law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks the one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does them, teaches them, and teaches them will be called the great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So, again, it's a slam on the scribes and Pharisees, um, but it's a notion of fulfilling the law in an appropriate manner. Um, the second thing about the intended audience, we see the Matheny community no longer remain within the association of synagogues. We find language over in the Matthew 4.23, Matthew 7.29, Matthew 10, 17, Matthew 13, 54, Matthew 23, 34, this your, their synagogues. Let me flip over to 423 to show you an example of this, if it'll work. There seems to be, again, this demarcation of not our synagogues, not my synagogues, but your or their synagogue. And come on, baby, come on, baby. There we go. Jesus went through Galilee teaching in their synagogues or to the Jewish people, their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom uh, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. So we find this your, their synagogue description as those passages. Uh, another uh, piece of evidence to talk about this uh, split of synagogues in the Athenian community is that the synagogues are cast in a negative light, like over in 6.2, 6.5, 10.17, 13.54, 23.6, and 23.34. The temple is cast in a positive light in 5, 23 through 24, 17, verses 24 through 27, and 21, verse 13. Notice there's a, a difference between the temple and the synagogue. Um, Judaism after the fall of the temple in 70 was very much based around the synagogue model, the local individual groups, congregations, a, a more of a decentralized model without no central temple, without any central temple, excuse me. Um, the Matthean writer seems to be echoing back to something big or something greater, something more, uh, maybe when times were better, I guess you could say, notion of the temple. Now, uh, a third characteristic of the audience or Matthew is the Matthean uh, community lived in conformity with the law. They maintained Sabbath, chapter 24, verse 20. Uh, the you know, commandment of love is the centerpiece of the law, and that's in Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the fulfillment of the law, the jots and tittles in 5, 18 through 19, those point to this notion of they're trying to live within the right teachings of Jesus, which are in conformity with the Old Testament. 
Uh, a fourth characteristic of the audience where Matthew is this notion of a, there's a breach between the synagogue and community lay in, in the relatively recent past. Uh, Ulrich Luz uh, theorizes since the portrayal of the Pharisees is so negative, this conflict is very recent, very fresh in the past, like the, the blood is still in the water or, uh, you know, the hurt is still there. Uh, and it's not something that's distant, but something that's it's very fresh. A fifth characteristic is the community has a mission to reach Gentiles. And there's several different places throughout uh, Matthew, but one key example is not just in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, or 8, 13, 8, 5 through 13, or chapter 15, verse 21 through 28, 21, 43, or 22, 8 through 10, but over in Matthew chapter 28... And we'll look at the uh, end of that. My computer will work. Now, the, this is Matthew 28, 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Uh, when they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. Anyway, he goes off and he gives us last commissioning to the disciples to go out and to teach. And it says in verse 19 to make disciples of all nations, not just Jewish people, but all nations. This may be some sort of insight to the transition from just an exclusive Jewish religion to something a little bit more branching out to Gentiles. Now, of course, there were Jewish converts, uh, God fears, if you were, that converted Judaism, Gentiles converted Judaism, or at least respected Judaism. It didn't necessarily go through the whole circumcision, but this seems to be something a little different. Now, as far as where was the Gospel of Matthew written, some theorize Syria. Ulrich Luce theorizes this. There's a mention of Syria in chapter 4, verse 24. There's a title of Nazarene in 2, 23. Uh, 15, 22 has a Syrophoenician woman. It's called uh, a certain designation. The uh, Phoenician population would have understood. There's references to the Gospel of Matthew being in Syria by Ignatius of Antioch and the Didache, which are very early writings in church fathers. So maybe Caesarea, maybe somewhere in Syria. Um, we don't know exactly, but those are pretty good guesses. Um, there are some th emphases on discipleship and teacher in the, the, the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus addresses teacher, this vocative uh, version of Dizosco, or Dizoscale, excuse me, in Greek, by outside parties, scribes and Pharisees, six times call him teacher. Uh, Jesus is called teacher a variation. Um, the Daskalos, and not the vocative, not the title, uh, or the side, I guess, you know, like teacher, comma, blah, blah, blah. But called teacher at least 12 times. So he's very much called a teacher. And one of those, again, one of those, and we'll go back to in just a little bit, that prime example of, uh, of uh, teaching moments is the Sermon on the Mount. That's one of the greatest blocks of ethical teaching. It's one of the most written about pieces of the, of the New Testament, if not the Bible, is... Um, chapter 5. Now we're going to skip, skip down to 544. We're going to talk about some discipleship, some ethical commitments of love and righteousness. Now, the the word disciple um, is essentially discipula in, in Latin or the, the Greek term is pretty much student and the student would learn from the teacher. So Jesus is a teacher and the students are the disciples. Uh, Jesus' disciples ex are expected to love. Uh, chapter 5, verse 44 through 45, you know, but I, I tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So it may be the children of your Father in heaven. For him, you know. But notice what happens just before that. And one of the neat things in, in what's called the antitheses of the Sermon on the Mount is this notion, you've heard it said, but I say. We'll come back to that uh, in a little bit, but just know here, you know, you've heard it said an eye for an eye, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. Jesus is reinterpreting the law here. Um, Jesus, is all, Jesus also teaches his disciples they're expected to uh, love his grace commandment in chapter 22, 37 through 40, the golden rules in 7, 12, uh, chapter 25, 31 through 46, God's judgments based on those who are loving and merciful. Um, another notion of Jesus' discipleship is righteousness, right conduct, in other words. Biblical characters such as Joseph in chapter 1 are called righteous. Abel in chapter 23 is called righteous. Jesus praises righteousness as a virtue in 5.6 and verse 10, 5.10, excuse me. Uh, 
Disciples are not to do their righteous, de righteous deeds in to be seen in chapter 6, 1 through 18. Right, their righteousness is to exceed the Pharisees, as is mentioned. In fact, Sermon on the Mount establishes the new righteousness. And as we mentioned, the antitheses, you've heard it said, but I say it. Now notice Jesus takes a uh, saying that's either from the New Testament or popular teaching of the day, um, and he reinterprets it. Not he, not he changes it or condemns it, but he reinterprets it to fit a different, higher ethical standard than what was given of the day. Um, you know, you, you've heard it say, whoever divorces his wife, let him give a certificate of divorce, so divorce was allowed. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for the grounds of unchastity, calls her to commit adultery. So something bigger and better than what was expected, uh, following God more closely. Again, this is this whole notion of he's not abolishing the law, but he's fulfilling every jot and every tell. He's reinterpreting. Now, think about this in terms of Deuteronomy. In the Old Testament, you have the first five books of Moses, or the books, or Deut uh, Pentateuch, excuse me, or books of Moses. Um, Deuteronomy is a little different. It's almost like it's a rehashing or retelling or reframing of uh, the first four books, at least the ethical teachings we find in those books or the, the, the story in those books. That's Moses. Uh, Deuteronomy is portrayed as Moses sitting on top of the mountain looking down his promised land that he can't go into and kind of recounting the things that have gone on. There's reinterpretations of laws in Deuteronomy. So there's a little bit of that whole thing going on. Anyway, let's go back to some points of interest in the Gospel of Matthew, and I'll let you be. I know I've talked you to death. Um, but the good thing is you're watching my screen. You're not watching me. Um, if you saw me, you might go blind, right? The genealogy of Jesus appears in Matthew, and it appears in Luke. Um, Matthew goes back to Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, very Jewish figure. Luke goes back to Adam, and we'll talk about Adam being the beginning of the genealogy because there's more inclusivity in Luke's gospel, more Jewishness in Matthew's gospel. But notice a few names as we go here. Um, we've got Abraham, father of Isaac, verse 2 here, and Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez. Okay, and this goes back to Genesis uh, 38, the story of Judah. Uh, and uh, there's a woman mentioned here, uh, Tamar. Okay, Tamar was one of Judah's son's wives. And, well, the son passed away and essentially uh, she needed to get pregnant, carry on the name, carry on the seed. So she tricked her father-in-law into sleeping with her, dressed up like a woman of the night, and he's going off to town, and she's on the roadside, and she says, hey, big boy, you want to have a good time? And she didn't say that, but you know. So this Tamar has a, is a woman amongst a list of males, has some sexual connotations against her. She dressed up like a woman of the night, a, a, you know, a, a, you know, a prostitute maybe, put it that way. And tricked her father-in-law into having, there's a whole hubbub in Genesis about this, tricked her father-in-law to, to, into siring a child. But anyway, keep going on. Verse 5 here, and we find, in Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, another woman mentioned. Now, who was Rahab? Okay. Um, Rahab is over in the book of Joshua. Um, notice that Rahab, in the story of the conquering of Jericho, the spies go in um, in Joshua, and they go check out Jericho. She, Rahab gives them safe passage. She hides them. Um, she's an innkeeper, and there's connotations there that she may have been a person with, portrayed as a woman of the night or brothel owner. Who, who knows? I mean, it's, it's out there. But um, she is a woman, mentioned in the story again, one of the few women mentioned, and she has some sort of sexual deviant connotations connected to her. Now notice just a few more words down. And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Okay. Ruth and Boaz in the book of Ruth. Um, Ruth, again, is another woman. One of the things about Ruth is, is when she, she gets Boaz to be her husband, one of the things she does is go to the threshing floor when he's good and liquored up, uh, drunk, I guess you go wind up, whatever it is. And she, um, you know, uh, uncovers his feet. Now, if you look in the 
kind of the slang connotations of that, she uh, may have done something sexual to him. So there is a bit of this kind of uh, sexual issue here going on with the story of Ruth. And you look over here in a few more verses. And David, the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. Now this is uh, a notion, uh, a mention of Bathsheba, but calling her the wife of Uriah. And again, this is one of those issues where David um, saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof. You know, in, the, in that culture, in those houses, they would go on the roof where it's cool. He saw her bathing. He had to have her. He, I mean, it's probably, she, I mean, it's one of those things where king forces on you, king wants you, the king gets you. So he got her, got her pregnant. He tries to have her husband, Uriah, a boyer, killed in battle. Um, so, I mean, has him knocked off. He gets caught in his sins by Nathan. But there's this notion of this Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, has this sexual issue going on in her story, too. But she's an ancestor of Jesus. Uh, and you keep going down all these different kings. There's Hezekiah, Manasseh. Uh, Josiah, one of my favorite figures uh, in the Old Testament, uh, and it goes on. And there's the deportation of Babylon. There's the other Zerubbabel. The, uh, Zerubbabel is an important figure in the Second Temple Judaism. Then you get down to verse 16, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, <coughs> excuse me, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. Now notice every woman mentioned in this genealogy has some sort of sexual issue connected with her. What about Mary? Well, she was betrothed. She was probably young. She was a virgin, according to the text here, or at least a young maid, depending on what you see the translation. But at least in the New Testament, she's considered a virgin. Um, she's not supposed to be birthing no babies. Uh, if I can borrow from the Gone with the Wind language here, I don't know nothing about birthing no babies. Well, she ain't supposed to have no babies because she is young, unwed, and a virgin. Well, she has a baby. So there's some sexual issue there. This may be intentional tying the story of Jesus back to the Old Testament, but also um, kind of maybe uh, making the issue of Mary being an unwed mother, a betrothed mother who didn't get knocked up, so to speak, by Joseph. I hate to say it that way, but it's kind of true. Making it a little less um, controversial, if you will. So that's all going on in the first chapter of Matthew. And of course, you know, if you just read through it very quickly, you miss these things. But you have to take and digest and say, well, who's this person? Who's that person? There's a lot of stuff going on here. Now, we talked about Mary and the whole virgin controversy. Um, let's see. We'll talk about the controversy part in just a minute. Chapter 1, verse 23. Um, if my computer decides to go up, uh, work here. Um, Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us, with us, and which Emmanuel, literally in Hebrew, is a Hebrew word, M-U-L, Emmanuel, excuse me, uh, the Hebrew words with us, and L is a reference to God. God is with us, or God with us. Now, this look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name Emmanuel, is Isaiah 7, 14. Well, the rub comes in, in chapter uh, 7, verse 14, is in the Hebrew text that we have, and almost every version of the Hebrew we have, which are all very close. Um, the word there is best translated as young maid, uh, young woman. It doesn't necessarily mean she's a virgin or not a virgin. Where does virgin come in? Well, in the Septuagint, the word that's translate, translate the Hebrew word for young maid or young woman is virgin. So, being a, probably a uh, man of his day, whoever this writer was, they probably uh, used the Septuagint as his Bible, his Old Testament, um, if you will, and that was his scripture. The Matthew, the Gospel writer Matthew quotes a Septuagint version, not the Hebrew Bible version. You know, and I've had discussions and arguments with people. Well, she's a virgin. The Bible says so. These new translations are perverting it. Well, because the, these new translations, like in IV and RSV, in, in Isaiah 7, 14, they're based more so off the Hebrew text as opposed to the, the other languages, uh, you know, Septuagint and, and stuff that the King James may be playing off of. Um, well, the text says young woman, young maid. It doesn't necessarily say virgin. The quote Matthew uh, is virgin because from Septuagint. We have to wrestle with that. And I personally believe Jesus was born of a virgin. 
Uh, the creeds teach that. I believe it. Uh, but this is something to think about in note of, of, of Scripture, that there is something going on here that uh, is a little different. <coughs> Excuse me. We talked about a little bit about the Sermon on the Mount. There's different things to think about. Um, This is the greatest ethical teaching we find of Jesus. There's the antithesis where, you know, we talked about with the, you heard it say, but I say, uh, Jesus goes up to a mount to teach these, this teaching. Um, let's see here. I'm trying to pull down here. Verse, uh, chapter five, verse one, he went up to the mountain. And after that, he sat down and his disciples came to meet. So, Moses went up to the mount to receive the Ten Commandments, so Jesus goes up to the mount to teach this new interpretation of the law, this, this greater righteousness that's been missing, I guess you could say, in, in Judaism. And we see the Beatitudes here in verses 3 and following, the blessed are. Now notice these pop up in the, my study Bible, or my NRSV points out they pop up in Luke 6, 20-26, which is often called the Sermon on the Plain, whereas now, this is important. I mentioned Jesus going up to the mountain. Again, Jesus is the new Moses. Matthew tries to tie in with the Old Testament. He portrays the Sermon on the Mount being preached on a mountain, whereas Luke portrays it being preached on a plain. Well, mountain may be some sort of literary device or shaping of the story to fit the context uh, for Matthew. Uh, we don't know where it was. Um, but anyway, it might have been a hill. Who knows? But Again, this mountain is something not necessarily literally significant, metaphorically significant. These blessed are, Luke says, blessed are the poor. Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. There's a different connotation going on here. We'll talk about that when we get to Luke. But all these beatitudes uh, are, you know, point to attributes that, that uh, true believers should have. Poor in spirit, more and meek, hunger, thirst for righteousness. There's this interiority of our righteousness we find the Sermon on the Mount that contrasts with the outer righteousness that's portrayed in the caricature of the Pharisees and, and, and scribes in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, now do keep keep in mind that every time you see this woe and critique of the Pharisees, especially like in chapter 23, this in some ways is a possibly a caricature over embellishment of the way Pharisees actually functioned in the first century. Um, this is kind of, you know, like I wouldn't say talking trash but kind of emphasizing certain details more so than others, maybe. Maybe that. Um, but we do see that there's an interiority of righteousness in the Gospel of Matthew, especially on the Sermon on the Mount, very much akin to this new heart notion we find in the prophets, uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, these later prophets who talk about a, an inward righteousness, uh, more so than an outward righteousness. That's very much in line with the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Let's see here, and so I, Sermon on the Mount is is, a, is very long. It's uh, very de detailed, and if I can get my computer to work, I've got a little outline to pop up here from one of the commentaries uh, from NIGTC. Uh, it's the Greek uh, based off Greek text, and uh, Nolan here's the writer here, and he kind of um, outlines the Sermon on the Mount. There's the good news of the poor in spirit. There's a, you know, the difficulties, uh, persecution mentioned there, um, call to be salt and light. Um, there's this righteousness. There's antitheses we talked about in, in five, practicing piety before others. And that's, again, that's that uh, outward righteousness that we see uh, these other groups doing the, the Judaism of the day that seems to be condemned by the gospel writer, um, making righteousness known. Uh, there's the golden rule. Um, see here and over, we have talking about authority. Um, and, and Nolan points here, the text here, 728. And so it happened when Jesus finished these words, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching with them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Now, one thing to keep in mind about this, the scribes uh, are often talked about, there was a learned class in Judaism in that day. They, And it goes back to the Old Testament days, uh, Second Temple especially, um, where there was, was, was a whole class of people who learned how to read, read and write. They were experts. I mean, they, they studied it and, and they uh, 
Um, these people, I mean, they didn't need the text to recite the text to you. The, the visual written text was more of a cue to remind them of a, a text they had memorized because it was a very oral culture, but they, they, were, they wrote. I mean, they were some of the few literate ones in the day. They were experts. I mean, they, so the old King James has a few times his translation, lawyers. They don't necessarily say lawyers, but they knew the text. They were experts. But Jesus taught in a different way. This is something a little different. This is something a little more, a little newer, I guess you could say. Something that's, uh, anyway. So we see that going on. Uh, one of the things we find in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, and if we find this in other Gospels as well, um, especially in Luke, are these things called parables. And my computer's being extra slow today. Parable of the Sower. Um, these stories, uh, parables, um, Jesus tells a bunch of these parables. But look at verse 10 here. The disciples came and asked, why do you speak in parables? Parables are very much using everyday agrarian culture, agrarian culture um, points of reference to reference something bigger and greater, more transcendent, like the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Um, the parable of the sower. Um, references sowing seed and references how um, commitment, ethical and discipleship commitment may take root or not take root. Uh, and there's, there's kind of a hidden meaning there. It's not being overt. So why do you teach in parables? He answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Again, that kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. But to them it has not been given. For those to have more will be given. They will have an abundance. But those who have nothing what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive and hearing they do not li they do not understand. That's harkening back to the Old Testament. And with them, indeed, is to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. You will indeed listen but never understand. You, you will indeed look but not perceive. People's hearts will grow dull and ears are hard for hearing. And they shut their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart. I will heal them. So, Again, playing off the Old Testament. But Jesus teaches in parables a great deal. And again, it's these um, earthly things, these very much agrarian culture references that people would understand to give them more of a reference point of what God's kingdom is like. Now, some of these parables um, are in different contexts, depending on which gospel. Notice the parable of sower is in Mark and is also in Luke. Um, they fit different contexts. These, these gospel writers, and again, this is where action criticism, source criticism comes in, they drop these stories into different settings in their different gospels, and somehow that tweaks the uh, overall interpretation of these parables. But, um, yeah, almost, I mean, most of these parables are about things that are greater and higher, like the kingdom of God, the power of God, uh, uh, things that Jesus tried to explain to the people, uh, you know, without you know, give them the reference points, but, you know, help me kind of be a little cryptic too, I guess you could say. So there are some points of interest in the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, thank you. Cheers.